My guest today is Sean Castrina. He is a serial entrepreneur who has started over 20 companies and still seeks to launch a new venture annually. Sean is also the author of three books, including Eight Unbreakable Rules of Business, Startup Success, and The Greatest Entrepreneur in the World. Thanks for joining me today, Sean. No, it's great to be on the podcast. Amazing. So I always start off with, um, please just let the audience members know a little bit about yourself, who you are, how you got to where you are today, yeah. and just maybe yeah. go back a little bit. Yeah, no, no problem. I think that that helps. I think I, I was a good high school athlete. So I think that's why I'm extremely competitive. And that that works well. And in entrepreneurs, in entrepreneurship, you either need to be really, really smart, you know, like the Zuckerbergs and the jobs and other guys like that. Like I don't picture them competing in sports very much, or you need to be very competitive. You need to have yeah. that. You, you, it helps to have a couple of those traits. So I went to college on a scholarship. If not, I would never have made it to college because I, I didn't grow up very well off and uh, got my dream job out of college and um, then lost that job during a leadership takeover, kind of it transitioned and decided then because I, I was 26 at the time that I, I absolutely was never going to work for anybody long term again because I thought I had the job that I'd have forever, you know. Uh, and and then I realized I didn't. <laughs> so that kind of started the entrepreneurial journey. And and obviously not 25 years later, you know, I just I'm always looking for a business that I can start and or expand a business that I currently own and definitely addicted to, you know, entrepreneurship, even at its smallest level. It's it, there, you know, there's just no downside of it. Once you get it going, it, it's, it's, it's just, pro it provides for people in a way that no other no other um, career can when you look at flexibility of schedule, uh, never having to retire, uh, you, you, know, you know, you don't have to get downsized. You, you, if you're going to get downsized, you're typically the last one to be downsized. So yeah, I'm just an evangelist of entrepreneurship. That's amazing to hear, man. So therefore, you have so much insights and um, I, I'm here to pick some of your yeah, brains, yeah, right? Just so fire away. <laughs> so regarding like, how did you get started? Because ultimately, there's so many people listening that are thinking of starting. They might have always had an idea, a dream. Yeah. They have some savings, but they don't even know how to get going. Okay. What would you say on that front? Yeah, a couple things. There's first, I find that there's a few myths and they're lies that paralyze people. The first one is you think you need to quit your, your job to do it. So that paralyzes you because, you know, you're, you're married, you have a kid, or you're just not in a point where you could just picture yourself giving up that guaranteed income. So that, that's one myth that you kind of got to get over because you can do two things at once. I never quit a job to start a business. Okay. So that, that's number one. That, that's a myth. The second thing is, is that people, they get too caught up in their idea having to be great. Like everybody thinks they have to have this shark tank idea. No, you just need to have a good idea that's wanted in your area and or a niche that you can carve out. But it's, your, your idea doesn't have to be as big as you think it just needs to be profitable. So I think people get too paralyzed on, on their idea having to be so, you know, earth shattering. And I think that a lot of times people think that they got to have business experience. I've had to go to college. That's, I didn't go to college for that. Um, so th that paralyzes them. They, they get paralyzed because they think it has to be perfect. Like there's perfect timing. There is no perfect. You know, you know, it's perfect. I'll tell you what is not perfect timing is waiting. <laughs> okay. I can, I can tell you that that's so, you, you know, you have to kind of get rid of the excuses and, and you just got to do it. You know, I think there's some due diligence you need to do. You need to qualify your idea. I think you need to do a business plan. It doesn't need to be 300 pages, but you need to do a business plan that at least makes you feel confident it'll work. It makes you feel like you have, a, you know, a target customer that you can reach with a strategy to reach them and then a, a strategy to get it off the ground and then continue operating. I, I wrote the book, The World's Greatest Business Plan. I just condensed it to like three things. So you can have a big business plan or a small one you know, you, that, that's, that's the simplest thing. You got to stop feeding yourself all these lies of why you're not doing it. And then you have to kind of, you know, do a little bit of a strategy. I tell people all the time, you know, if I gave you a free vacation right now, I said, hey, here's, here's $10,000 free vacation. You would not get in your car or go to the airport right this minute. You, you'd plan it. 
You know, you'd go on Expedia or you'd go on Hotels.com and you'd decide, well, do we want to take a winter vacation or summer vacation? What is it we want to do? Do we want to go to amusement parks? We want to go. You would do, people spend more time planning a vacation than they do their startup. And, and that's, you know, ends up being a disaster. Yeah, I think you hit it on the nail. There's so many people that procrastinate and they think they need to be perfect before they jump in. And I, I myself am completely opposite where mm -hmm. I jumped in without even knowing anything about SEO. Yeah. I just knew there was a need in the marketplace. I filled that gap and I pretty much just ran with it because there were people willing to pay for my service. That was and how I started my, listen to me, my <laughs> company that's making me millions of dollars Listen to me, I can't put together a three-piece birdhouse. I have an eight-division massive construction company that makes me millions of dollars, and I still don't know construction. I still can't put together a three-piece birdhouse. But I know what customers want. I know how to create up systems. I know how to recruit and retain talent. I understand marketing. Okay, so the few things I'm really good at, I, don't, I can always hire somebody to swing a hammer. That's the easiest thing I can find. So yeah, I, I, I find a need, fill it, start a business. Oh, that's amazing. So in terms of like growing up, I know you were a varsity athlete and yeah. whatnot. Um, were there people or were there people that uh, changed you or kind of brought you up to like wanting to be a business owner? I just knew I didn't want, no, I just knew I didn't want to be poor. There's a couple things I saw growing up. I saw my dad work six days a week, 12 hours a day, and live week to week. So I knew that that model, just, just, just search and describe. There's like a few things that you like notice in life and you don't have to hear a big lecture. Like a couple of them. I saw people smoke and then I saw them age and they look like crap. So I'm like, that doesn't really seem to work. You know, they cough and you hear like a lung coming up. So growing up, I was like, uh, you know, I didn't have to have anybody tell me to not smoke. I was like, that doesn't look like it works really well. I watched my dad work really, 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 really hard, yet we didn't have any money. Okay, so I knew that couldn't have, couldn't have been the answer. And I knew not having money wasn't great. It created stress in our house. It, it, there was always tension and, and all that. And, and so I, I just kind of was like, hey, this, I, I'm going to do the opposite of what I'm seeing here because I, I don't think this works. But was there people that kind of guided none, you through? None, none. Okay. I just knew I didn't want to be poor. I, I can't explain. I just knew I didn't want to be poor. And um, so, I, what, and like I said, my first initial plan was to get a really good job, you know, go to college, do the, yep. go to college. I went to grad school, got a, a very prolific job for my age at the time. But then I was let go. So that, that, that was a false narrative. So I, I was doing what most people do to get ahead. I got a, went to college, got a great job, got further my education. Okay, that's the plan. Get a, and get a really good job. That didn't work. That was at 26, I, I, I did that. And then somebody said, hey, we, we don't need you anymore. So it was like, okay. Then at 26, it was like, okay, this model doesn't work. So we got we to gotta switch models. And were there... Um I guess it was all self-taught, like yeah. living life. But then were you always uh, curious? Like, were you reading? Were you always, you know, learning throughout the know, years? Or? I know you want to hear that, but I, and everybody does, but no. Okay. This is what I, I, I I'm, you know, I, I, some people are just, as an athlete, let me just give a good al athlete illustration because this is how my brain works. You can take two athletes and they have the same ability. Okay, if you ask them to do this move, this move, two tennis players, you say hit a forehand, they all hit a forehand, hit a backhand, take a few volleys, hit a few serves. You look at it like, oh, they're pretty, pretty even. Then somebody dominates, of these two equal people, someone dominates, you know, that's not as physically gifted. How do they do it? They're mentally tougher. They never quit when it's, when, it's, when it's tough. They have a strategy that eliminates mistakes. And there's a reason why Andre Agassi, probably not, you know, you would look at whatever, you know, he had a strategy. He knew if he hit it to your backhand a thousand times, you were going to miss. You know, so you, so I always knew that in like in business and just in life, like, I, okay, if I, if I work at something really, really hard and develop, put all my time and energy into it and develop my strengths, I just knew I would succeed because in sports, it always worked. 
No, it put, makes sense. Yeah. So I, I knew there was a formula for success. I was a high school state champion. So I, I, I already had a taste of what it's like to be the best. And I knew what it took to be the best. And I, I knew if you kind of applied yourself, you know, that there would be a result. I don't think it's that hard to learn anything, you know, r- really. I, if it's something you're interested in, I think people make business ownership far more harder than it is. It's, it's not so much knowledge. Example, if you give me somebody with a relentless work ethic, okay, endless energy, competitive, likable, I'll, I'll give you back an entrepreneur. I don't care what they know until you give them to me. But if you give me somebody who's lazy, no focus, who's got 160 you know, IQ, I'll give you back a professor who's teaching business but can't run one. I totally agree. I, yeah. I mean, work ethic, habits, routines, internal, uh, I guess, mindset, yeah. uh, training and perseverance, and all these are traits of successful people in general, right? You, yeah. Like when I worked, I was, I was fortunate for the few years that I worked to be around really – so I think getting a job is like not a bad thing. I'm going to other break a statistic – the entrepreneurship under the age of 30 is only 3%. Like 3% of all businesses are started by people under the age of 30. Okay. So you're not the entrepreneurs you think you are. Okay. You're, you, the sad part is under 30s talk about doing a lot, but they don't do a lot. They're, 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 you know, they just don't. They just don't take action. So my point is this, is that you, you've got to, you can, if you get a job, let's just say you become an employee. And I know that's like a curse word in entrepreneurship, but I look at, what I learned as an employee, I learned the structure of leadership. Okay. When I looked at the CEO, I'm like, man, how did he do this? Like, how did he get this position? So I'd go to lunch with him. I'd take him out to lunch and I'd pick his brain like, okay, how did you do it? And then he'd say, well, you know, I had, I started an organization in Indiana here. And I said, well, what, what made that one work? I did this. And then, well, what made you do this? Okay. I had access because I was likable to this person who was within the industry, a genius. So I got to go to lunch, pick his brain, see leadership. I like I learn. I learned how, how you like in a staff meeting, I was like, had an idea. Like I had something that I thought was so good. And afterwards he says to me, Sean, great idea. But let me tell you how you got to get it across. Plant an idea like a seed, not like a bullet. Well, guess what? You can take 10 college classes that one statement changed everything in that, okay, I, I, I get excited about an idea, but I can't pound it into somebody. Kind of plan it. He said, you're, he said, when you have a really good idea and you know how to plan it, it'll come back six months from now and somebody else will bring up your idea and they'll be your biggest advocate. So I, you know, so I learned, you know, you start learning. I learned industry. I learned, you know, I remember going to a meeting with him, a super high level meeting. Again, he liked, he liked my energy. I was young. And that, that's why I'm saying likability. You know, there's only so many Mark Zuckerbergs and, and Steve Jobs where you can just be, you know, basically not that likable, but you're a genius. I say, if you're a genius, forget everything I'm saying. If you're Elon Musk, genius, forget all I'm saying. You don't need people skills. But, but they work well for me. But I remember we went to a meeting one time, very high level. And I'm like, wow, you know, aren't you kind of like wondering what's going to happen? He goes, no. I go, well, why? He goes, well, I already know what's going to happen. I go, well, how, what do you mean you know what's going to happen? He goes, Sean, I don't ever go into a meeting that I haven't already stacked the meeting to come out with the results I want in the meeting. If this meeting wasn't going to go the way I think it's going to go, I wouldn't be in this meeting. And, I, and he went through it. He goes, Sean, he goes, I've had four meetings this week to prepare for this meeting to make sure everything goes the way I want it to go. So I learned there's the meetings before the meetings. You know, just, I'm just throwing little things out. So you can go work. I mean, I know this is an awful concept, but you're 18 years old. I get everybody, I'm 18, I got a great idea. What should I do? I go, get a job. Get a job. So you can understand leadership, management, responsibility, how to work with coworkers, how to resolve conflict with customers. You know, you can learn. There's so many ways to learn business. And I don't, you know, I'm weird, but I don't think working is a bad concept. Yeah, I think experience is definitely something a lot of people have to understand to get before 
starting their own business because there's so many different facets of it from operations, marketing, sales, customer service, all these other processes that you need to understand, right? But I think like likability, like you mentioned, yeah. personality, these traits are so important in terms of, you know, you got to be the biggest advocate of the product service, yeah. right? And you have to understand what your customers really want, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I wanted to kind of go back and ask you, because okay. you've been doing it for 25 plus years, you've ran 20 plus businesses. Um, what have you kind of learned in, in so, so many yeah. of these businesses? Like maybe some of the most successful ones, um, are you still running them? And what were some of the exits yeah. that you had? Um, and what happened? Yeah, okay, so you know, we go through my entrepreneurial journey. It's the first company I started. This is funny because it wasn't a sexy company. I, I just created a passive business service company, an auto detailing company. Because yeah. when I lost my job, I sold insurance for a year. And I noticed there was really nice cars in the parking lot. And I'm like, wow, wouldn't it be cool if you can get your car clean while you were here? And this is 25 years ago when there wasn't a car wash every 600 yards. So I created Waxmaster Mobile Detailing. America's Choice in Mobile Detailing was a tagline. Phone number was 888-933-3824, which means toll-free we detail. I understood marketing. That's my point. Even then, I, I knew what I knew. I was like, okay, I, could, I, I knew I could make the phone ring. Well, I created a 50-50 split with the laborer. They did the labor. We split everything 50-50. I had you know, some operating costs, but I made $35,000 doing nothing while I was selling insurance. I knew right then that was my, that was my incubator, <laughs> you know, my beta test on how companies could run. I learned that you didn't have to work in it. I learned you didn't have to be an expert because I didn't know anything about, you know, selling cars. I, I, I mean, about cleaning cars. So I, I kind of did that for two years. And then I sold that company when I actually started a direct mail magazine um, because I started really understanding advertising. And so I ended up selling it to a client of mine. The business is still around 20 some years later. My wife actually sent me a picture of one of their vans repainted uh, at a traffic light and it's still wax master. Um, so, you know, I, I started with that one, but then I understood service companies. And then in the service company, I started understanding marketing better. And then when I understood marketing, I started a direct mail magazine uh, that we had in 23 cities. I sold that in 2008. Um, but in 2000, I started a, a handyman company because I couldn't get anybody to fix anything. I tried to set up a home office in my house, and it was like trying to find a one-eyed leprechaun. Well, that handyman company ended up turning into a multi-million dollar construction company that with eight different companies in it. And that's why in 2008, I sold it. Um, and then I started a digital marketing company because uh, I didn't understand digital marketing. So I hired somebody to work with my company, did a great job, and then I bankrolled that startup. And so, you know, you just, when you're an entrepreneur, you're, you're always looking for an opportunity. You're just extremely alert to pain points and problems, and they typically turn into business opportunities. Especially when you know how to run a business in the first yeah. place, right? And you know what to look for in terms yeah. of like uh, failures and successes, especially on a personal level doing it yourself, you know the time that you're... Yeah, I, the eight unbreakable rules. That's why I wrote that book because I knew that I had more successes than failures. And I'm like, well, what, what am I doing different? Because I would talk to people like, oh, it's much harder than that. I started a business and it failed. And, you know, and I said, you know, I started looking at what I did differently and just kind of started writing down like one sentence, little axioms or principles that I had followed. And then I kind of laid them out and they, they really came into some rules that, that I, I, like, why did I succeed? Number one is I think you have to be a great entrepreneur. There are personal qualities that, that I said earlier that I would bet on. If, 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 you know, if, you, if you're not willing to work extraordinarily hard in the beginning, I don't buy in that you need to work 100 hours a week forever. But there is that first heavy lift. It's like a roller coaster ride. You know, you work your butt off to get to the top, but once you get up to the top, the roller coaster, that first lift takes you through the rest of the rides, which is the fun part, the curves and the loop to loops. But if you don't do that first climb, you don't get to enjoy all the rest. And that's the way it is typically in any endeavor. You know, that, you know, Malcolm Gladwell, the 10,000 hours, okay? There, there is that heavy lift. So you got to, you have, you need to have the qualities of successful people. 
and they're they're maniacally focused when they're going after something. They don't jump from one idea to the next idea to the next idea. I have a lot of ideas, but I only focus on one at a time. They're good at building teams. I know what I stink at, so I'm good at recruiting people to fill in my gaps. Uh, you know, I, I, so I understand where I'm, where I'm weak. I understand where I'm strong. So I think, you know, you need to embody the great qualities of entrepreneurs. It, leadership. You can't lead, a, you can't grow a company that you can't lead. I mean, that's really simple. So you got to learn how to be a leader. And you can read a ton of books on leadership, but, but you got to, you know, you got to work on your leadership. You got to be a salesman. You're going to be an entrepreneur. You're going to be selling all the time either selling yourself to employees, to, you know, manufacturers, to vendors that you want, to contractors that you need, you're all, to investors, you're always selling. Communication skills, your ability to convey an idea, your ability to negotiate. The, you know, I'm just winging these. I don't have many notes in front of me, but the, I know these are what you need. So if you give me somebody with those qualities, you have a far greater chance of that business succeeding. So I think the first thing is being an entrepreneur, you know, being the right entrepreneur. Second thing is passion is an entrepreneur's mistress. I am passionate about tennis and golf. I am passionate. I love reading. Okay. But let me just say this. I wouldn't go buy a golf course. I don't know how you make money in tennis other than being a pro. So at my age, that won't work. And then I'd, I would not own a retail bookstore. So my point is just because I'm passionate about something doesn't mean I think it's a good business idea. And I think that's one of the biggest mistakes entrepreneurs make is that they, they somehow think their passion is a business idea that's profitable and it's not. And I think that's where they get crushed. Totally. Um, yeah. Did you, over the years, did you ever like um, turn to coaches or mentors or doing like mastermind classes and groups? I think they're all training? good. I've kind of created my own. I, I, business mentoring, I went to an older gentleman who was actually a client of mine in my magazine and um, he was in his early 70s, Ben, great guy. And I remember went in, I said, Ben, I want to take you to lunch once a month forever until you die and I need you to live a long time because I got a lot of things I need to learn. And I, and I did. I took him to lunch every month. I'd pick him up, take him anywhere he wanted to go eat lunch, and I'd pick his brain, take him back. And, and I found that, you know, veteran entrepreneurs love sharing their advice. That was yeah. the easiest free mentoring I ever got. Yeah. And you, you know, I always say, if you ask three business owners to mentor you, two will say yes. Just don't waste their time. Make it quick, you know, coffee or lunch, come prepared, make it brief, tell them thank you, rinse and repeat. And, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm a fan. I have coaches for everything I do. When I want to learn how to play golf, hire a golf pro. You know, when I wanted to, you know, I, I just think it's, when I wanted to learn how to write, I took a writing class. <laughs> you know, so, yeah, I think that you always hire somebody who can tell, help you get there faster or take you further. That's, I have no problem. I will absolutely ask for help or pay you. I like a person right now working with me on a, a YouTube thing because I don't understand YouTube channels. So I hired somebody who has a big YouTube platform. I'm a writer. I have a New York Times bestselling author that I talk to about every six weeks on how to develop book ideas and whatever. Yeah, I'm, I'm a fanatic. I think that's, that's how you get somewhere faster. Definitely. I think you hit it on the nail. Like, just go out there, meet people get to know them, pick their brain, because I was fortunate. I was doing sales and marketing for many years at Yellow Pages, and I've met with thousands of business owners, and every single meeting I had was really to pick their brain to uncover how they became who they were, right? And they were thousands of very successful, small, medium-sized business owners, and these little traits I learned were invaluable, and I felt like each of them brought me some you know, something in terms of teaching, teaching me to get closer to where I want to be. It's funny that you say that because when I worked with my magazine, that's what made me start my, my business. In other words, I, when I really now look at, you know, because I, I own the magazine and that's entrepreneurship, but it's all my small business clients. When I started my home service company, like 
I was I I got I got so much good advice because I had so many successful clients yeah. where I could go to them and go, okay, what what works the best? What advertising works the best? What what would you what do you wish you would have known? The guy's yeah. like, well, don't get a big office. All you need is a desk, yeah. hundred square feet. Don't pay more than two hundred bucks a month. Okay, I got it. You know what I mean? Answer your own damn phone. Don't use an answering service. Yeah. You know, just little thing. You know, just you know, guys like just giving you one sentence, gruffly. Yeah. And, and, and that really did kind of give me, you know, a, a tremendous advice that helped me on my, on my startups. Yeah. And those were invaluable, right? Because all Absolutely. it cost you was coffee or lunch or whatever yeah. it is, once a week, once a month. Yeah. It's all about these little tidbits of advice that you would not be able to get through any professional. It'll cost you thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? I tell people, you know, hey, six... Failure is best heard through a secondhand story. So I'd rather hear it from somebody else, a veteran entrepreneur telling me a mistake they made. It's a heck of a lot cheaper. Exactly. So, and do, yeah. And ask. don't be afraid to ask, right? Like my, my thing is go out there and be curious. Start wanting to learn, right? Like a lot of people are fearful. People are scared of rejection or fearful of what the other person is going to say. Well, how do you know if you're not going to ask, right? I, and funny, as an entrepreneur, working, like, yeah. I, I love that. It's funny you say that because I have a book concept in my head. Everything that ever changed in my life, big time, involved a big ask. Yeah. Like I had to ask somebody for something that was very uncomfortable or just whatever, you know, and, and your ability to ask is, is definitely a critical component, one of the most critical components to success. Exactly. And you have to understand and realize where you're missing uh, gaps in your life, right? Like, w like you mentioned, YouTube, you're not strong at, so you look for someone that's very strong and they will advise you or give you the, yeah. the advice, right? Like it's simple. Find somebody who is further than you are. Yeah. It's really, I don't take financial advice from somebody who's not a lot, heck of a lot more wealthier than me. Yeah, you know, exactly. I, I, I take advice from people who, again, are, are further down the road or, they're, or they could take me faster and further. You know, I, I take advice from somebody who's where I want to be in that one area. I, I love you saying that because when I was working at Yellow Pages, I saw a lot of 56 year old sales reps, but also business owners. And I was in my 20s, right? Yeah. And I was always trying to inspire to be like them. I wanted to be driving their car, living in that neighborhood, um, have a very, you know, happy family, I would say. Yeah, yeah, no. Some, I, and that's something that, you know, you kind of always want to progress and have goals, right? And I love hearing that from someone like as successful as yourself, right? Yeah, I, listen, when I first started working, I remember, I mean, I always had that idea of it could be better. I remember taking my wife in the car and driving through very expensive neighborhoods. <laughs> and, I, and I would tell her, I, I think our, and I would always talk as if, you know, I, I think our house will be like that, but I'd like to have that kind of turned a little bit, or maybe we'll expand the porch. And, and listen to me, I looked at some amazing houses. Okay. Let me just tell you, the house I live in now is nicer than any house I, I looked at. I looked at amazing cars. You know, I always wanted to have this and want, trust me, what's in my garage now is two times more expensive and twice as nice as any car I looked at. But I was looking at pretty nice cars at the time, you know, the Lexus and, or, you know, at the time the Acura legend was so nice and all that. My point is, is that, yeah, I mean, I, I'm a firm believer in, you know, associate, get your brain very tuned in to what you want. Oh, I'm, I always had a picture of a car I wanted in my sales kit. Yeah. You know, I remember, I, you know, working sales in college, working my way through college and I knew the car I wanted to drive. I, I've always known the house that I wanted us to live in. Um, and I remember saying to my wife, we went to a restaurant one time and there was a, a BM, BMW five series. And I said, yeah, I want to get that, but I want it in black. Well, you know, within five years, we had the BMW 5 Series in black. And I'm not saying material things, but the, the fact is this, is that there are some payoffs for doing things well. Okay, if you saw LeBron James driving a nice car, you wouldn't be shocked by it. Well, guess what? Entrepreneurs are a whole lot richer than, than LeBron James. And LeBron James makes more money through his entrepreneurial efforts than he does playing basketball. He's done a great job leveraging his brand and his talent. But there's 32 NFL business owners, and every one of them 
is an entrepreneur or their family member was an entrepreneur like Ford. You know, they inherited the team and things of that nature. So entrepreneurship is a rarefied club. And the, and the spoils of success in it are, are really nice. Yeah. I, and a lot of these things that you're talking about, like it's, it's incredible how many people are not focused to really understand what it takes to be an entrepreneur, right? Like they're so jaded with, yes, they want to see that, but they're not willing to put that effort or time to really learn and making mistakes and going out there and asking and going out there and doing something about it, right? They're always thinking they want to do it, but they don't actually take action. And that's the biggest thing yeah. I, I've learned over the years. Like, like yourself, we, we're now entrepreneurs. So, like, yeah. I, I love what I do. I'm very you know, grateful yeah. of the opportunity and all the clients I have, right? But it's all about like just helping and really letting people know like it's not rocket science, but if you have that passion, that willpower, and really that desire to do something about it, go out and do something about it. Don't speak about it. Do some, yeah. take action, right? Yeah, I mean, the bottom line is, if, yeah, if you don't take action, you know, you're, I, I always tell people, my dad, will, you know, is in his early 80s. He would bet his life that he came up with the idea for Jiffy Lube. Well, you know, he never took action on it. Exactly. And, the guy, and the guy who launched it, you know, did okay. So, you know, ideas are a dime a dozen. I, if I get a, yeah. I, I get a DM every day about an idea and I'm like, okay, great. You know, we'll do something about you it. Do something with it. I mean, yeah. an idea is nothing without an incredible effort applied towards that idea. Relentless effort applied towards it is the only way an idea becomes anything. Exactly. So in terms of some of the mistakes that yeah. you've made as an entrepreneur, uh, can you maybe yeah. go over a couple <laughs> of the major ones and then how did you overcome them? Yeah. Okay. A couple things. This is that growing too fast. So you get a good idea and you have a business and you rob it to grow other businesses or to expand it. So you got something that's really good and it's good in your area and you just assume it can work everywhere. That's not always the case. You really need to be careful in your growth because what ends up happening is you kill the golden goose. Yeah. So you have a really good business and then you, you think it'll work in other places and, and, and that is just not always, sometimes you can't reproduce that, that magic. There, there's not enough target customers in that area or whatever the case may be. You can't staff it the way you did. So that's one mistake. I always felt like I could duplicate my success and that is, you know, that, that definitely, so, you know, I, I love growth, but growth needs to be smart and don't ever kill the golden goose for growth. If you're robbing from, if you're taking money from your left pocket and putting it in your right pocket, it's all the same money. So if you're going to start something, you're going to grow your company, don't be very careful how much resources you take from your existing business. Because what will end up happening is, is that you, you end up killing both of them. And it's that that's one of the biggest mistakes I made. And then number two is I love business partnering. It works extremely well, but you need to have a partnership agreement gotcha. before you ever, and don't partner with anybody that you wouldn't leave your family with. You wouldn't leave your checkbook with, you wouldn't leave your pin number to your ATM with. So uh, that's the two most painful, expensive mistakes I made <laughs> revolve around the, you know, expanding too fast and, and killing what was working to feed something that wasn't working. And then uh, partnering and either have to buy a partner out because they weren't in it for the long haul. So, you know, I had, now I have agreements where you're not getting a dime anytime soon. You gotcha. know, if you leave in the first decade, goodbye. Um, so yeah, so that's important. So how, how many active businesses are you currently working on right now? And how do you end some of them to pursue yeah. new ones? Yeah, the key is partnering is that I have nine right now that I'm that are, you know, taking time of mine and one that's a startup. So 10 that I'm involved with. Um, I have partners in every one of them. So I have a partner running every single company. So I only have to directly report to them. And I only partner with people that can lead a company and is an industry expert because I know that's never my, you know, I bring capital to the table. I'm good at systematizing things, getting them off the ground. I'm good for the first 18 months. I'm good at branding, but I don't want to run the day to day. 
I don't want to be caught up in the minutia. So my strength is I partner in every one of my businesses. I would rather make 50% of a lot than 100% of a little. I'd rather make 50% of something I don't have to work for anymore than 100% of something I got to put 80 hours a week into. So that, that's kind of has been my, how I've been able to do more than one business. And I, I love the fact that you know where your strengths lies, right? And if you're the money, VC or the capital, then you know what you can leverage, right? Which is your expertise, your experience through that growth stage, right? Um, and then typically, do you exit after 18, yeah, I mean, months? I don't want you no, to I'm in. I'm in. I mean, my partnership agreements are 50-50 partnerships. Um, we split all revenue 50-50. Typically, if they're working, you know, doing much more than me, I'll do like a management fee. So we'll split all profit after a, a reasonable salary. But no, I want fi- if I get it off the ground, I want I, I, I look at these as annuities. Gotcha. So I I want to I want to I love that I got passive money coming from everywhere indefinitely. And then how do you allocate time? Because working on one business is already time consuming. How do you allocate nine or ten? Yeah, I only have to work with the leader. So gotcha. that's the beauty of it. And the longer the leader's with me, the less I have to work with them. So, I mean, I'm, that's why I started my podcast, the 10-Minute Entrepreneur Podcast, because I had all these business partners and I was mentoring them. I mean, my number one job is to mentor them so that they can lead the company, handle customers and know how to hire. So I would do these kind of these 10-minute, you know, quick, um, you know, memos, <laughs> you know, voicemails and things of that nature. I'm like, I need to turn this into a podcast. So now I have to just develop my leaders and then they have access to me. If there's ever a problem, I always tell them, if you know, it's going to get back to me anyway, or if you know, it's something that I can handle faster than you bring it to me because then I can show them how I solve it. So I get them involved and I go, this is the problem. This is what we need to do. This is our options. Watch how I handle it. And then I don't have to do it again. They learn it and then they, they do it. So I just have to spend the time developing people. Once you develop people, yeah, rich people get good because they hire people as good as they are or better. And I have people that are every bit as good as me or better working with me. And, and I love the fact that you're working and a lot of people that are in the business cannot see how it's operated from the outside. Right. And that's why if you're not in the business, you can actually take a look from the outside on a different perspective as well. And I, I love the fact that, you know, you hire people that are in it, but yeah. they don't really see what's behind. And that's what you bring to the table, right? Like yeah, the outside perspective. They all know this. Every one of my business partners, I always tell them this in the beginning. I said, just, you need to know this because there's going to be a day where you're going to look at what I make and it might piss you off. <laughs> you know, you're going, man, but always remember, if it wasn't for me, this business would have never got off the ground. I remind them of that about in the very beginning and about two years in. I go, just remember, this business would have never got off the ground. So 50% of a lot is better than 100% of a little. And so they all get it. And I have really have never had anybody, you know, ever. I've never had a problem in that regards down the road because they all know that. That's amazing. So in terms of like um, what drives you today as opposed to that same desire as when you first started, is that the same, you know, motivation that you have, the same passion that you, you know, behold in terms of like where you see yourself today as opposed to 25 years ago? Yeah. I mean, 25 years ago, I was an animal. I was a lion who ate the lion. I remember going to a personality assessment thing with my wife and they were comparing people to animals. Like you're either like a Labrador, you're nice and you're playful or you're like a deer or you're, you know, well, it's, and they said, well, what is Sean? My wife said, Sean is the lion that eats the lion. So back then I, I was going to succeed and do, you know, and, and now I'm, now I don't, I'm much more of a coach. You know, I have my podcast because I want to equip, encourage, and educate entrepreneurs. So, you know, that's the 10-Minute Entrepreneur Podcast. That makes me feel good because I know I can give advice to people and, and help them not make the mistakes I've made. So that's, that's why I write the books. So now I love, you know, for me to teach business and to be current, I feel like I need to own a business. Like if I didn't own a business, my stuff would be so stale. You know, it just – so I love being in the, you know, cr- cr- you know casting the vision for a startup and – you know, rebranding a company that maybe is 20 years old 
which I recently did. And so I, I love that I'm involved in all of it because I think it makes my content much more uh, current, practical. And is and, there and credible? Exactly. Is there certain uh, verticals that you focus on or is there certain industries or is it you just love get, jumping into uh, different I industries? like service companies, service okay. companies, service companies. I like them because they don't, A, they don't require warehouse space. B, you, you know, the um, labor is typically directly related to immediately providing the service. You normally don't have any dead money. They don't cost as much money to start. They typically re require two things to be successful. Great marketing, got to create a wanting customer and hiring talent, two things that I'm really good at. So where other businesses, you got to have manufacturing, you got prep patents, trademarks and all that, you know, that makes my head pop. So service companies are my, are my strike zone. Another mistake, don't think you can do everything good. I tried that one time and failed miserably in a business well outside my strike zone. So let me throw that out there. Yeah. And then you understand your strengths, right? You know what you focus on, what you're good at and what you're going to spend most of your time doing, right? Like, yeah, I'm, I'm very maniacally laser focused. focused. I'm laser focused. I absolutely know that I can do maybe three things well, and that's all I spend my time doing. So what excites you? What motivates you today? Teaching, uh, equipping, encouraging and educating entrepreneurs and, and then having a platform that's credible and that I like that I can talk about businesses that I've actually started and but entrepreneurship is just, I'm, I'm passionate about it. It can, it can change people's lives to me for the better in any country. You know, it's, it's harder in other places, don't get me wrong, but entrepreneurship is, you know, it's just a tremendous career that it doesn't disqualify anybody. If you think about it, okay, it may be harder. I'm not discounting that, but in the United States of America, any race, any dollar, you can start with no money, and I've, you see it all the time, can make it. I mean, you can, you can, you have a good idea and you work hard enough at it. You can make it in this country with, with little to nothing and you can do it with no education. I mean, the greatest, you know, the wealthiest entrepreneurs in our country, 60% of the Forbes top 10 list did not graduate from college and none of them ever went back. I find that so fascinating. Think about it. Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, all the way down the line. None of them go, you know what? I'm going to run a billion dollar company. I think I should go back to Harvard. None of them went back. Steve Jobs, none of them went back. All of them knew that they could learn the required leadership and skill by surrounding themselves with great people. I always find that so fascinating. That's amazing. So aside from business, um, what are some of the um, other major pillars that mold you to who yeah. you are today? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, if you're you know, the bottom line is, and it's, we've heard a lot, if you make money and your family hates you, you failed. Okay, let me just let you in on a secret. <laughs> you, you failed. I mean, I love the fact that I've got two children, you know, one 19, one 25, and I talk to them every single day and they still love me. I like the fact that my wife can still stay in the sight of me and I still can make her laugh every day. I'm glad that I still have my five best friends from when I was 18 years old. So one was from high school and four was from college and I've merged them all together. And I, I have five friends that I would do anything in the world for. I like, you know, I think relationships are important. I think that, you know, if you, if you, you know, you got, sometimes you got to look at yourself and go like, I, I go to the golf course and I see a guy playing golf by himself where he's playing with his wife. And I got to be honest, I kind of go, well, I'm not so sure about this. Like if that's the only person, if you're 55 and the only person you get to play golf with you is your wife, listen, I love my wife and she can drive the golf cart, but she's the last person I want to play 18 holes of golf with. Every, you know what I'm saying? I mean, come on, let's be honest. I mean, so, I mean, you got to build, you know, I, relationships are critical. And if you die because you got fat and out of shape, you're not a lot of help to anybody dead. So, you, you know, I'm healthy, I exercise, and, and, and I'm fit, and, and I think that's important. So, yeah, I, I, you know, you got to have some balance. And I, I love hearing that because a lot of people lose focus, right? They get so focused on one thing only, and they forget about what's really important to them, right? Yes, yeah. business and money might be, but really it's all about family, the impact, the relationship, friends, things that really matter, especially during this pandemic, yeah. right? Like, I mean, yeah, no, it's... You're so right. I mean, my, we just have certain rules and I, I, like I learned one like parenting. This is good advice. They interviewed, they did a research on all the spelling bee, the kids who were the, you know, and they're very smart kids. They can spell words that I can't spell. You know, there was only one common denominator in all the brightest kids. This will blow you away. 
they ate dinner together with their family <laughs> every night. Nice. So that was something that I, you know, I see something that works. I did it. To this day, we eat dinner within 15 minutes of the same time every single night, and I don't have my phone near me. So, you know, you do, yeah, you know, you got to be present. So I, my family knows every night I'm a captured audience for 30 minutes yeah. every single night. So, you know, you got it. You got it. You know, man, how busy you are, you got to carve out time for things that matter. Exactly. Health, family, Absolutely. whatever, like your hobbies, whatever it may be, because exactly. people just forget about that. Right. Um, and I, I have a young child. So for me, it's all about like picking people's brains that have, yeah you know, older children that have kind of moved away, but they're still really close, right? Like that yeah. bond is irreplaceable. And I love yeah. the fact that family is the most utmost important in a lot of business owners' minds as well, right? Yeah, you have to. I mean, like we had certain rules. I mean, we, you know, like we never allowed our kids to take their phones in their bedroom. Yeah. Phones stop at the steps. Yeah. We never let them have TVs or computers in their bedroom. Now we had a, they had a family, we have a family computer, but I want to see what they're watching. Yeah. We have a family, t you know, I have a mat, my house is like 9,000 square feet. I don't care. There's no TVs in any of my kids' bedrooms growing up. Their phones didn't go up the steps. Yeah. There's nothing good that happens on a cell phone when your kid goes in their bedroom. Just so you know, there's nothing. So yeah, you got to just use some common sense and, and your kids want to be parented. They actually want to be parented, you know, some, some, you know, and, and that's why I think I have great relationships with my kids. Yeah, no, that's awesome. So uh, thanks a lot, Sean. Yeah. This was a lot of fun. So where yeah. can some of the listeners get a hold of you, your business? Yeah. What's the best way to reach out to yeah. you? I'm very simple because I give everything away. <laughs> so the 10 minute entrepreneur podcast, if you listen to podcasts, everybody loves podcasts. Mine's quick, 10 minutes every day. I interview some of the biggest business leaders on the planet but I teach three days a week on it. I answer questions. I have a mentoring series on it every Saturday morning, but it, it's just a quick 10 minute course on like, if I was training somebody to be my business partner or my son to start a business, this is what I would give them. So 10 minute entrepreneur podcast is a game changer. If you go to my personal website, seancastrina.com, I'm always giving away one of my books for free. Free, like you get the ebook, no, no strings attached. Uh, I think the world's greatest business plan book is on there right now. It has a great chapter on how to be a great entrepreneur. So go to my personal site, uh, go to the podcast. If you ever have a business question, you can send it to me on Instagram, but that, that's, that's how you get in touch with me. Awesome. Really appreciate all your time and insights. Um, I know you, you have a very busy schedule, so I really appreciate uh, you being on the show. Thanks a lot, Sean. Great. Thank you very much. It was great to be on the show. Thank you.